Um, so basically, um, the Shroud of Turin line, when you get in line, you go at your appointed time, and if it's uh, a weekday, it's going to be a smaller crowd. But if you're there on a weekend, it's going to be a bigger crowd because 90% of the people going are locals. They're all within 200 miles. 10% are people from all over the world. So I don't know what day you have, but if you have um, a weekend ticket, you, you definitely want to get to the beginning of that line probably 20 minutes before the scheduled time just to make sure you get in it. Um, otherwise, it's going to be pretty easy if you, if you have a morning appointment before 11. Do you all know what time your appointment is? It's 8.30 in the morning. That is absolutely perfect. So we'll perfect. be up very what early. Day? What day? Um, it's, it's a Monday. It's Monday, okay. Monday. There's actually a... Now, the Pope is, there on, sun, the take, Pope is there on Sunday. Yeah, if you're, if you're there on Monday, that's really good. But the problem with Monday after the Pope is a lot of people will come in Sunday to see the Pope, so there's going to be a lot of people left over Monday. So you're going to have, you're probably going to have a pretty good crowd, but usually a Monday morning at 8.30, nobody's there because the out-of-town out of visitors are all asleep and having breakfast, and the locals are all at work. So it's, it's not going to be too bad. But let me tell you, once you go through the line and you enter the church, no matter what the people say, no matter what the guards say, you need to go to the left side. The crowd is going to form like a funnel. And you're going to funnel into three lines. And there's three rows of people who view the shroud at the same time. You want to go far left, far left, far left constantly because that will put you right in the front row. Oh, okay, good tip. Okay? So that otherwise you'll be 5 to 10 feet or 20 feet further back than the front row. They let you look at it for about five, six minutes. And you are allowed to take pictures, but no flash. Okay? So no matter what the sign says or what everybody says, everybody's taking pictures with no flash. It's okay. Now, let me tell you, just in case something weird happens, that would mean that there's nobody there when you get there at 830. If there's nobody there, you're going to walk right through the whole line, uh, not the line, but through the covered, protected area, right to the church. And if you get to the church and there's nobody there, your eyes won't be able to see the shroud for about two minutes because your eyes have to get used to the dark church. So we, that's what happened to us. We got there at 8.30 in the morning on a Wednesday, and there was nobody there but us, and our eyes couldn't see. So I, I had to tell the guard, we're not going in, we're not going in, we're going to wait. So we waited two minutes, and then your eyes adjust to the darkness because the, the light that comes off the shroud is not real, real bright. We're trying to protect it. But if you're in the church, in the dark church, you know, four or five minutes, because you're in line, that will be fine. Okay, you all got it? Any questions? So you're facing the church, stay on the left side, right? Yeah. As soon as you get in the church, you, okay. whatever group of people is there with you, you keep going to the left side of the group. Okay. No matter what they say. No matter what they say. Just pretend <laughs> you can't understand them. No capisco. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me ask. Can everybody hear? Yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, okay, because some people cannot hear. You need to dial the phone number I gave you, seven um, six four one seven one five three five eight zero, and then the access code. You talking to me? Yeah. There's no. There's no audio. No, I'm talking to the other participants because they're saying they could not hear you. All right. You're talking to the other participants. But they need to dial. They need to dial right, the phone number. I send them the email. I'll wait. I'll wait. I'll wait. I'll wait. Okay. Um, Bell, are you able to hear now? Please sign. Sound off. Emma? Uh, 
I think they're trying to dial now. Okay, I'm no hurry. Okay, I'm no hurry. Huh? Huh? Ah. Emma, are you in? Ah. Emma? You're supposed to dial the phone number I sent you in the email with access code so that you can hear the audio. Okay. All right, Doc, let's go ahead. Okay, I'm, here it goes. Okay, here it goes. So, Can you um, give a brief introduction about yourself? Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm a 68-year-old um, so um, board-certified board internal medicine and allergy and immunology and doctor. I've been in practice 35 years. I was raised a Catholic. I went to uh, Jesuit High School, went to University of Notre Dame, went to University of Miami Medical School. And all those years and all that Catholic connection, I never heard of the Shroud of Turin. So I was watching TV in 1977 or so, 1976, and on the screen pops a show on the History Channel about the Shroud of Turin. So I said, what the heck is that? That's a Catholic object and I never heard of it? So the first reaction I had is I was mad. So I had to say, hmm, how come nobody told me about this? So I had to figure out how to deal with it because I was married to a very good Catholic and I wasn't about to tell the church to go jump in the lake. So I had to figure out if their shroud was a fake or it was real. I had to figure it out myself. So because I'm a doctor, I knew I would understand a lot of the science of the shroud. So I, I, you know, I was trained never to take anything, you know, just because somebody says so. So of course I had faith in the church, and I believed in Jesus and, and heaven, but I didn't necessarily believe in the shroud. So I had to convince myself, and it sounded impossible, that a cloth was 2,000 years old and had an image on it of Jesus and uh, and the blood of Jesus. So the reason that the, how I did that. I figured out what I knew more about than anything else in my brain, and that's allergy. So in the allergy world, you all know what pollen is, right? Pollen, trees, grass, weeds, pollen. So that's, I'm, I'm an expert in that because all allergists are experts. So I said to myself, if, if they're going to fake me out with some lies about the shroud, I'm going to be able to expose that because I know too much about pollen. There's no way they can lie to me. So I looked at all the literature that was written about pollen on the shroud, and over about four or five weeks, I convinced myself it was real because a medieval forger back in 1400 or 1300 didn't have a microscope, and there's no way he would do anything other than ga gather yellow stuff. He wouldn't know what it is, and he wouldn't be able to distinguish between different trees and grass and weeds, and he wouldn't know that... There are different trees in Jerusalem and different trees in, in California. So that convinced me the shroud is real. So what happened then is I spent uh, all the 77 to 1988 really enthused with the shroud, learning everything about it. But I had four kids and I was coaching them in sports and high school soccer and all. I was really, really busy. And then in 1988, the carbon dating was done. And that kind of blew my mind, and I figured uh, since carbon dating said it was uh, the linen of the shroud was taken out of the ground in, in 1290 to 1340, that I had been duped, that I, it's a fake, that I, my ego was blown. I thought I'd just an idiot, and I was easy to, to fake out. So I lost all interest to it until about uh, 2001. And in 2001... The uh, carbon dating was proven by studies by reputable people, I'm going to tell you all about it, to be done in error. The carbon dating was a big mistake. So that brought me back, and then I started getting interested enough about four years ago 
to decide in, in my semi-retired life, I'm working about 25 hours a week, and all my kids are grown up, and I don't have anybody to coach soccer. I have a bunch of grandchildren, about 10. So I had to figure out what to do with my spare time. So I said, I'm going to do something good. I'm going to do my passion of the shroud, and I'm going to tell the public about it because nobody knows about it. So the Diocese of St. Petersburg gave me permission, and in those four years, I've given over 90 presentations. I've been on EWTN twice, two-week shows, 2012 uh, for a week, uh, half-hour shows on uh, Women of Grace, and then we did it again this Easter, also one week of shows, half-hour each, Women of Grace in 2015. So I also decided for me to be able to give talks to the public and to get people to think I'm not a quack, I had to get some credibility. So I applied to the Vatican to, to get a diploma in the Shroud. So I took a, a one-year course in the Shroud, Science of the Shroud, from the Apostolorum College, and I graduated and had a diploma in the Shroud two years ago. So that's my background. The next thing I can tell you is I'm a member uh, of, I'm probably the 134th member of the International Shroud Science Group, and that's made up of people who have been invited, but it actually is people way smarter than me who are the real scientists on the Shroud. So I got invited because I happened to live in the same city as one of the major researchers in the world, Joe Marino. I happened to live in the same city his sister does, and she asked him to invite me, and he invited me. So I've been getting their emails, all their scientific emails, for the last three years. So everything I tell you is up to date. And I go to their meetings. They had their most recent meeting was in St. Louis. I went to the National Conference, and I met all these people. I felt like I was a groupie at a rock rock, rock uh, convention. All right, so here we go. So you're going to... Hear what I know about this and maybe in about 40 minutes and then I'll answer questions so you get some background. So I'm glad you're going. It's, it's a really big deal. So, I act, so when I present this, I present this only from the standpoint of science. I speak as a doctor. I don't speak as somebody with a faith or, or a message of religion. I'm not trying to push any faith. And when I get to the end of it, I tell everybody you've got to make up your own mind, but I believe this is the real thing. So here we go. All right. So, we start out by quoting the Bible. Mark says, Joseph bought a linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it, wrapped it in the linen cloth, laid it in the tomb, then hewn out of rock. Also, John has another account that's even more detailed. So, what we have, the first thing the shroud shows us is the image on it shows that the man of the shroud was in a state of rigor mortis. So, he was completely nude which you would not expect if you're a medieval painter and you're trying to please the local bishop. People didn't go around drawing paintings of Jesus and God nude. They would be kind of uh, excommunicated. So the thing that's right off the bat that's convincing <coughs> is that the man of the shroud, I try not to call him Jesus, is nude and his arms are stiff and his legs are stiff. So that stiff body <coughs> was um, put down on the shroud uh, half of it, and the other half was curled around his head and then put on top of him. So the shroud is touching the front of the body and the back of the body. Now the basic facts are the shroud is made out of expensive linen. There's a lot of linen cloths to go back to Egyptian times, 2,000 years old, and has a herringbone weave. <coughs> now it has blood all over it, but it has definitely blood in the right place. But the big deal the thing that no other, no other cloth, no other linen cloth in history that's ever been discovered, what it has on it is an image. And the image is all the characteristics of a picture. It is so detailed. And this picture, just bottom line, 21st century, we cannot figure out how the picture got there exactly. So this is what you're going to see. <coughs> this is the Shroud of Turin. And you can see that in, to the naked eye, the way that people looked at it for, uh, until um, 1898 was this way. So you can see two rows, four, four burn holes across the top, shaped like little triangles, and across the bottom, <coughs> excuse the cough in here, um, the same burn holes. <coughs> and in the middle is the image head to head. So on the left, you can see the face 
chest and arms moving from the center to the left. And if you move from the center to the right, you can see the back of the neck and, and the, uh, his back go down his legs. And at the very far right, you can see his feet. Now, what happened <coughs> when we got to the digital age, we were able to take this picture and turn up the contrast. So the contrast turns up and Hello. I saw you. Yeah, we're here. Sorry. No, oh, you can hear me. Okay. <coughs> All right. So the uh, cloth is 14 feet long, 3 feet wide, which is a double image. Okay, now this is a close up of the front side, and you can see the uh, man of the shroud has very long hair. You can see eyebrows, you can see his eyes his cheeks, his nose, mustache, beard. You can see um, those burn holes a little better that are, took out his shoulders. Oh, that's from a burn that happened in 1532 in Chambray, France. The, uh, the shroud was inside a, a silver case and there's always been somebody trying to destroy the shroud. So we think they set a fire and on purpose uh, the, le the, the silver was melting and one of the drops burned the edges. So try to ignore the burn holes and the little triangles, one on his chest and one on his knees is the water stain. So you can see uh, blood on his wrist and blood trickling down his arms. And this is the back image. You, at the top you can see uh, blood all over the scalp. You can see potentially a little ponytail. I'll show you that better later. And you can see scourge marks all over his back. You can see that he's nude. You can see that his knees are pulled up and you can see that his right foot there is planted flat on the shroud as if, as if you were uh, underneath a, a glass table and he was lying on a glass table. So what we now going to go over some of the history of it. So there is the documentation that is uh, unassailable, totally cannot be denied, only starts in 1357 to the present day. Everything before we have to piece together. So there's a bunch of different quotes out of uh, scriptures and historical documents. There's mosaics of the image of Christ. There's um, paintings. All these things have to be put together to try to trace where he has, where the shroud has been. So this map shows you what we think today. We think obviously it started in Jerusalem. And then uh, during the persecution of the Jews, the Romans were uh, destroying every Christian activity. All the Jews were being destroyed about 70 AD. So we think the shroud was uh, whisked out of town to Odessa, Turkey, which is presently Urfa, somewhere between 30 and 944. And when it got there, fortunately, there, the uh, city became Christian. Uh, when the shroud arrived, that's the way the story goes, and it was Christian for a number of years. And then uh, either the son or the grandson of the first king who made the first Christian city, Edessa, when the uh, grandson or son took over, he reverted back to paganism. And so the uh, people that were the keepers of the shroud hid the shroud. And then um, it, it comes back to its present form so everybody can see it around 595. I'll give you more detail. And then in 944, it uh, ends up in Constantinople. It's in Constantinople until the Fourth Crusade. Fourth Crusade takes it away in 1204. It goes by way of Athens. It's in the possession of the Knights uh, Templar from 1204 to 1355. And then the yellow color that you see on the slide changes to white because we're now in documented history. Le Ray, France, 1355. Chambéry, 1452. And Turin, where it presently is, it's been in Turin since 1578. Okay, so now we're going to show you some of the proof of what, why we think this little road map is accurate. So there's a um, theory then based on a story that King Apgar uh, is the one that asked the shroud to be brought there in 70 AD, but of course they brought it to protect it. And then it was hidden in a wall, and when the uh, government converted, uh, switched back to paganism until 12, 525, and in 525, there was a flood, let me see, 525 there was a flood and they rediscovered the shroud and it was found in a wall. Now, let me tell you, um, the doubters of the shroud 
will tell you there's nothing in history written about a 14 foot long claw. And that's true because the shroud was folded into about four times, so the 14 foot length actually ended up only showing the headpiece, the rest was folded. And in that folding situation, it was put in a frame. And the frame had a matting on it, and in the middle of the matting was a circle where only the head of the man of the shroud was showing. So that was, that's filled to the literature. The image of Edessa is quoted many, many times in the literature as everybody was looking at it. So our theory then is under that horizontal framed uh, picture was really the shroud all, all folded up. Okay. So what happens in 525, something uh, overwhelmingly statistically happens. Every painting, every mosaic, every artist's perception of the appearance of Christ's face before 25 showed a young man with no beard, no mustache. All of a sudden, every painting and every picture and everything that's carbon dated after 525 from the artist's perception shows a beard and mustache. So you can see in the top left, <clears throat> the uh, before 525 mosaics of a very young looking Christ with no beard and mustache and then at the lower bottom you see one that carbon dates to 525 left and right and the one on the right I actually saw because it's in Ravenna, Italy I was able to see that about three weeks ago <clears throat> so up at the top is a painting in 550 AD this painting exists in a museum in the Sinai Peninsula you can actually go see it so these things then show from 525 forward till the present day, every artist thinks Jesus, the man of the shroud, has long hair, beard, mustache. Not a clean shaven guy. Now, when you take the painting of the Pantocrator from 550 AD and you put the digital image of the shroud's face over it, it matches in 180 positions. Those are called points of congruence. So the distance between the pupils, the distance from the uh, pupil to the tip of the nose, the length of the nose, the width of the mouth, all those points coordinate exactly between the shroud image and the painting. So that tends to be a fingerprint showing you that the artist who painted the picture in 550 AD was actually looking at the shroud's face. Now, in 944, the army, powerful Constantinople, goes over to uh, helpless Edessa, very weak army, demands the shroud, and they bring it back to Constantinople under much fanfare. They open up the framed picture of the image of Edessa, and they find out for the first time it's not just a framed picture, it is 14 feet long. So you can now see uh, the pink cloth that's being held there, the general's on the left, Jesus' head is in the middle and the king's on the right in this painting. And the name of the uh, cloth at that time was called the Mendelian. So you have to look in all the literature. You have to look for Mendelian. You can't look for shroud. So, that, so the people at that time are quoted as saying, the image is not made by human hands. It must be moist secretions. So that is, that is the proof we have with Constantinople. There's one more proof that's overwhelming because... At the same time the shroud was in Constantinople, some artist painted the inside of a Bible. It's called the Hungarian Prey Manuscript. It's in Hungary now, and it carbon dates to 1196. So an artist who'd had, who did this painting had to be looking at the shroud. So the shroud existed before the carbon dating. You can see on the bottom the carbon dating said the shroud was, was created 1260 to 1390. So 100 years before that, I'm going to show you what this painting shows. And in this painting, there are details that no human being could just make up. So we have the top, Good Friday, and we have the bottom, Easter Sunday. So here we go. The top is Good Friday. So what made an artist decide to paint the man of the shroud with no thumbs? That is really crazy. Everybody else in the picture has no thumbs. I'll show you the back cover, which is even more people that have thumbs. Also notice that, again, the man of the shroud is nude, his arms are crossed, and he has long hair. Now, there's the real shroud, and you can see the real shroud has no thumbs. Okay, so on the Easter Sunday, bottom half of that picture, you can see the herringbone weave, and most importantly is on the left side, 
of the painting, there are four circles that are an upside down L that represent the same exact four circles that are on the shroud. Those are on the right, you can see the actually same burn holes. So it would be hard to believe that seven coincidences would happen at the same time. Herringbone, nude, long hair, crossed arms, no, no thumbs, four L's, just impossible. <coughs> so somebody had to be looking at the shroud to do that painting. Here's the other painting <coughs> that's in the back of the uh, book. And you, the uh, head at the top is Jesus with an angel holding him. And you can see in white, I've pointed to the area where the thumb should be. So uh, the man of the shroud has no thumbs. Then you have the saints are holding him and Joseph Arimathea. You can see the thumbs and you look down to the bottom of the picture. Everybody has thumbs. So we got six human hands and six thumbs. Of course, they didn't show both hands. All right. Now, the, the uh, fourth crusade happens. So the Venetians and the French sent an army. Uh, unfortunately, it never made it to uh, Jerusalem. It landed in Constantinople, and the Venetians had no uh, belief that they were going to do anything good for tourists and, and, and pilgrims anyway, so they looted the city, and the French helped them. So all the gold, all the treasures went to Venice, and all the religious relics went to France. Uh, so between 1204 and 1357, the shroud was in the possession of one of the leading uh, Knights Templar, Geoffrey de Charnay, who was in that battle. In 2009, Bar Dr. Barbara Frail, a Vatican archivist, found a quote that said, 1287, the Knights Templar worshipped the bearded man. So that means for that 150 years, the Knights used it for induction ceremonies, and they would kiss the feet of the shroud and bring in their new members. Finally, the shroud makes it to Lyre, France, 1355, under the ownership of Geoffrey de Charnay, and the first documented exhibitions happen. <coughs> Those continue on into Chambéry, and finally it's moved to Turin, Italy. So the part that we, we need you to really cone in on is uh, Geoffrey de Charnay's great-granddaughter. Now, his great-granddaughter was Margaret de Charnay, or Margaret of Austria. She lived 1480 to 1530. She became the owner of the shroud when everyone before her died off, and she built the church in Chambray to house the shroud. But she said, I'm going to build this church, but I need to have a piece cut off of it to put as a uh, relic in my church. So she did that, and because she had no heirs from two marriages, she then gave the shroud away to the Savoy family, which were the king and queens of Italy, in 1520. So just to remember now, I'm going to talk about how the carbon dating was wrong, and the first part of that story begins with the missing corner of the upper part of the shroud. There are actually paintings that were done in 1500s that show the entire shroud. Somebody did a painting, a copy, and there's no corner in the upper left-hand corner. Okay, so then the shroud was uh, held by the Savoy family for 407 years, and not till the last king died did the Vatican actually have ownership. That wasn't until 1985, so I'm sure you're quite surprised. So now you're going to be going to the Turin Cathedral on the right, St. John the Baptist, and um, if you went when there was no exposition, you would see the shroud in its, in its burial spot in a, in a crypt that's uh, to the left of the main altar, behind bulletproof glass. Well, you're not going to see that. You're going to see the real shroud right in the middle. So the case that it's housed in now is a bomb-proof steel case with argon gas. All right? So the documented history, Charnay family owned it for 165 years, and then the Savoy family owned it for 465 years until they gave it to the sitting pope. The owner of the shroud is whoever is pope. So that's the story of, of the history as best as we know. Now, the first scientific thing that happens to the shroud happens in 1898. Somebody takes a picture. So Segunda Pia, an, an attorney with a hobby of photography, took the first photograph in 1898, and you're looking at it. So what he was seeing in the face is what we would call a photographic negative. I hope some of you are older than 30, because if you're older than 30, you would know in the good old days we'd put film in a camera, take pictures, and then we'd have to take the film into the drugstore to get it uh, developed. So what you would walk out with would be negatives 
in one part of the envelope and prints in the other. So this is a photographic negative characteristic. That means a person in the shroud is dark, a person in the picture is dark and the background is light. So the natural shroud, natural light, has the characteristics of a photographic negative. However, Secundo P, I got into the dark room and made his typical negative of a negative to get a nice print, and that became a positive of the shroud, and he was shocked out of his mind because this is what he saw. Now, that is an overwhelming different wow. view and different details that are not seen in the other image. So this is a photographic negative of the real shroud, and actually, because of the negative negative, it becomes a photographic positive. And now you can see long hair, blood all through the scalp, recessed eyes, a long nose, big mustache, and if you can maybe even appreciate, there are two rows of teeth. I hope you can see the teeth. Can you see the teeth? They're hidden behind lips and the lips are closing over the teeth. So a little hint, hint, hint on what might have made the image of the shroud. It had to have some capability like x-rays. So there you have the, the, the real picture of the shroud with natural light and the photographic negative is on the right. Now, in 1931, the cameras got better. So this next shot is a really high quality picture taken by photography in 1931. And now you can see even more of the body in even more detail. So I'm going to point out right now, because I'm going to have a lot of stuff to tell you that's going to freak you out at the end of this talk about the appearance and why the appearance is what it is. Look up, up at his head. He has no cheeks and no ears. You can see the side wound coming out of the right side. Now, because this is a photographic negative, the orientation of the body is exactly left-right as it is. So you, this is as if you're looking right at him and you're going to shake his hand. So the, the nail on the wrist is in his left wrist and the blood coming down his arm is in his right arm. So this is to keep straight. So now you're actually looking at the orientation as he was, as he was lying on the, the stone and lying on the shroud. This is the, from behind. So this is the, the back portion of the shroud picking up an image. And you can see the blood all through the scalp. You can appreciate a very long ponytail, which is a typical Jewish tradition. In my mind, I also see hair that covers the whole width of his head that looks like somebody used a hair blower on him. And the hint on that is static electricity. Just keep that in mind when we get into some physics. You can see scourge marks all over his back. You can see blood and water that by gravity is falling down. Now just remember, this is the position as if he's lying on a, a, a glass coffee table and you're underneath lying on the floor looking up. So the water uh, proceeds and the blood mixed together goes along his lower back. And you can see the four burn holes on each side. A little better to see the four burn holes on the left and you can see that his knees are up. Okay, so nothing happens from 1931 to 1976 except the two photographs. But in 1976, the uh, Vatican gets some courage to uh, start listening to the scientists of the world. And here's why they listened. Okay, what happened is that um, the United States of America had created NASA, and the United States of America had created atomic bombs. So this was through the Manhattan Project. And Sandia Corporation was, was part of the corporations that were built the first atomic bomb. Well, finally, when we got into peacetime, the Sandia Corporation built something that went into satellites, and that was called the VP-8 Image Analyzer. So that would go up in NASA's satellites when they were uh, photographing the moon, and it would pick up the differences in, in gradations of light, just the differences of black to white aimed at mountains and valleys, and because of the differences of color, the image analyzer would turn that into a 3D relief, and you could actually make a, a, a pretty good estimate of how tall the mountain was and how deep the valley was by gradations in color. So the closer the, uh, the, uh, the satellite was to the top of the mountain, the, the more uh, image uh, whiteness, the more reflected light. So the same thing is true of a cloth, so uh, potentially. So Dr. Jackson... Uh, John Jackson, phys physics professor from the United States Air Force Academy, he decided to take that original picture 
of the Secundipia and put it under the VP8 image analyzer to see what would happen. So this is the picture he put under the Im image analyzer and this is what he got. He got a 3D picture. So that was just about the same amount of shock from the 3D picture that Secundo Pio had when he did a black and white image. So this, this is the only photograph on the planet that you can put under the VP8 image analyzer and it reads the encoded information hidden in the picture that gives it a 3D quality. So you can obviously see the nose stands out high, the eyebrows are high, the eye sockets are sunken in, the right cheek is all swollen, you can see the lips are puffed. So this 3D image, and here's the whole body 3D image, this 3D image excited the Vatican to have confidence that the United States was smart enough that they could trust the United States to do real scientific studies and touch the shroud. So they gave them permission. So the United States set up a team in 1978. It's called the Shroud of Turin Research Project. It's made out of 40 United States scientists from Los Alamos, Lockheed, IBM, United States Air Force Academy, Jet Propulsion Lab, Brooks Institute. And they represented all the uh, disciplines below. So they set out to form this team to go look at the shroud and figure out what made the image. So the team, interestingly, was made out of 38 people who were high-level scientists who were agnostics because the problem with science is the people that are scientists get to be know-it-alls and they lose their faith, <clears throat> as I know somebody in the room that I'm sitting in. And uh, so they become agnostics and they knew they were going to go see the Shroud of Turin, prove it was a painting, have a good meal in Italy and come home. Two people, however, were real believers in the Christian faith. Three, three were raised Catholic, 34 were raised Protestant, and funny to say, three members were actually Jewish. They brought uh, 80 crates of equipment, and it valued about $2.5 million. They worked for five days, and because they were all honest scientists, when they left, they could only say the shroud is not a fake. It's, it's that, it just can't be a fake. Now, they didn't say it was Jesus because there is one missing scientific test that I'll tell you at the end um, that keeps any scientist from saying for sure it's Jesus. Now, this is the pollen part. This is where I got into this because I knew that what, what I'm telling you here is accurate. On the Shroud of Turin, there are three types of pollen only found in Jerusalem. 14 types only found in Israel because they're unique. They exist nowhere else. And there's 58 types in Istanbul, Constantinople, France, and Turkey. So that matches our little tour we took of the shroud. And how did a man taking this thing in 1400, 1300, before there was a microscope, how did he pick out the right pollen and how did he go to Jerusalem and find all that and sprinkle it all over the shroud? Pretty hard to believe. So the most common pollen on the shroud <clears throat> is Gondelia turniforte, 23% of the pollen. And it comes from the plant that has a wooden base with sharp spikes on it. Sharp, sharp thorns, about two to three inches long. So this is theorized then to be the plant that the crown of thorns was made out of. The blood was also analyzed by the chemists of the Shroud of Turin team, the Sturp team, and they found out the blood was AB, very rare, and they also found out that the man of the shroud didn't use monkey blood because there's a way to, to type blood to, to distinguish primates, monkeys from men, and that's called the MNS system. So all monkeys and gorillas have MN, but only human beings have the S marker. So the man that faked all this back in 1400, he knew that already, right? he knew that he was going to get blood from a human because we would figure this out in 20, 20th century and, and uh, expose him as a fake. Baloney, he didn't know that. So in the white blood cells, they also found X chromosomes, easy to see, and Y chromosomes, and nuclear DNA, but the DNA was degraded. One of our hopes is to have mitochondrial DNA, which represents the genetic material of the mother, because it's easier to find, but nobody's given us permission to go look for it yet. So the next point was the forensic people, the chemists, and uh, people that knew blood and pathology 
were taken back when they saw the shroud because the blood was so red. They said, this got to be fake. The blood that's old is always black. So they had to wait almost two months till they got home and sampled the blood to figure out the blood had high amounts of bilirubin. Bilirubin is a, uh, a breakdown product of red blood, red blood cells when they uh, when hemolysis takes place and breaks the red cell, all the bilirubin leaks out. Then it's absorbed by the other red blood cells in circulation as long as the person's alive. So when, when finally the extra bilirubin red blood cells were bled out, that's when they covered the shroud in extra red blood. So that means that medieval faker had to also use tortured human blood. The next thing is the blood all over the shroud shows a clot and a serum halo. And the only way any person on the planet can see serum on a clot is they have to shine UV ultraviolet fluorescent light at it. So again, the medieval faker, he was so smart, he invented UV fluorescent light. This is uh, the clot on the wrist. You can see the, the fluorescence going on around the clot. The microscopic team uh, of the Stirk team looked at the threads and the fibers of the image and there was nothing on the fibers. There's nothing there, no paint, no dyes, no, no burning, nothing there that can be seen. This is Dr. Jackson looking under the microscope and bouncing wavelengths of light called spectroscopy off the image to see if there's any elements of the periodic table. And there was nothing bouncing off that image other than linen. No components that could have made a picture. <coughs> they even aimed x-rays at it. And the x-ray was stopped by the blood, but it wasn't stopped by pigmentation or paint because there wasn't any there. Nothing else stopped the x-ray but blood. The image itself is overwhelmingly confusing to today's phys phys uh, physics professors because if this is one fiber, it's made out of 200 microfibers. So the image that we see of the man of the shroud resides only on the top two to three microfibers. So whatever energy came out of that body, it was so weak and so controlled, it didn't burn through the whole fiber. It only changed the two, three fibril surfaces. And human beings are not being able to, to duplicate that at this point. Also, the, the energy then had to also be pixelated. It had to come out in a straight line, and it had to hit one fiber to make a change and not the next fiber, or you would have no picture. So um, it was a very fine, controlled mechanism. Okay, so take a little breath. Now we're going to apply that science in the way <coughs> it, it uh, agrees with the Bible and also in the way it disagrees with the Bible. So when I first heard that the parts of the shroud agreed with the Bible's story of crucifixion, I said, now isn't that convenient? Isn't that strange how it shows everything? Doubting Thomas, me of course, had to look at it. Now, as I looked at it, yeah, I was more convinced it was real because the, Im the information on the shroud disagrees with the Bible just a little bit. It disagrees with our concepts of what actually happened. And you wouldn't think that a medieval forger would know all that or would make up all that stuff. You'd get in trouble for disagreeing with the Bible. So let's go through the details and let's see how it agrees or disagrees with the Bible. So the man of the shroud has a fractured nose. He was beat up. His right cheek is all swollen. He's been scourged with a taller man on one side, a shorter man or other, and he's tied to a pillar. And there are no scourge marks on his arms. Can y'all hear me? You okay? Yes. I hear all kinds of noise coming through the computer. All right, I'll just ignore it. All right, I'll just ignore it. Okay, and then the scourge was happening by the Roman flagrum. Those are long leather strips with dumbbell-shaped uh, lead on each side. And you can see on the right all the marks all over his back, over 120 scourge marks. He lost about half of his blood during this time. And if you saw the Passion of the Christ, it's pretty accurate. All right, so the first thing the Bible and all the perception of man drawing pictures of Jesus is that the man of the shroud does not have a crown of thorns on him. He had a cap of thorns. So he had a huge pile of uh, thorn bush smacked on his head with a piece of wood or something. No burly Roman soldier took times to do some basket weaving and make him a nice little crown. 
And that plant that fits all that is what we said before, Gundelia turniforte, found in the Palestine desert areas. This is a depiction of what the real crown of thorns look like, or cap of thorns look like, and it's in the Shroud Museum. You definitely should go to the Shroud Museum. It's about a one-hour uh, event. It's about four or five blocks from the church. Definitely go to the Shroud Museum. If you can, go before you see the Shroud. I don't know what your timing is. So the next point that the, the, uh, the perception that we have on Jesus carrying his whole cross is impossible. First of all, he couldn't carry it after losing half his blood. But the Shroud shows that he did carry the patabulum or the cross piece. Because you can see now from upper right going down to lower left, abrasion marks and moved left to right, kind of wiping out the scourge marks, like rubbing through the scourge marks. Those are friction abrasions brought on by somebody that's being pushed by a piece of wood and it keeps moving and pushing. So then we have the biggest point of all that the Shroud of Turin seems to be convincing that's authentic is because our perception of all the crucifixion statues and paintings and mm -hmm. all uh, show the, the nail going through the palm of the hand. <coughs> that is a uh, physical impossibility uh -huh. because the weight of a body cannot be held up by a hand. So the nail of the Shroud of Turin actually went through his wrist. You okay? You guys can hear me? Is it okay? Should I stop? Yeah. No, 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 no. Keep going. Guys, we cannot keep, hear you. Okay, keep going. All right, I'll keep going. All right, so the Shroud of Turin, it disagrees with all the pictures because the nail is actually in the wrist. And that is the only place you can put a nail that will hold up a body. Now, getting back to what I said about the shroud has no thumbs. If you put a nail in the wrist, it bisects the median nerve. The median nerve is what controls the thumb. So the thumb can't move and it goes into spasm. And when it goes into spasm, uh, you can't see it on the image on the shroud. So that explains it. You also had one nail in his foot in the metatarsal area. Then you had the spear in his side. And the blood that came forth was blood and water, because you can see what happens when blood sits in a test tube. The blood goes to the bottom. So when the sword went in, it went into the bottom, and all the blood came out, followed by water. So the uh, Bible is right. Blood and water came forth. Of course, it wasn't water. So we were all nice and happy people. 1978 to 1988, with over 100 studies, all proved the shroud was real. And then the bad thing happened, the carbon dating. So the carbon dating said that the shroud was brought out of the ground and made somewhere between 1260 and 1390. So that shut down all the research in the shroud, all the people gave up, and all the believers in the world kept, didn't give up, they kept calling on the phone and writing letters to the science people of the Shroud saying different excuses on why the carbon dating was wrong. So the derogatory term the scientists Excuse made me. for those believers, those people calling all the time, was the lunatic fringe. So the lunatic fringe showed up in 2001 in the form of Sue Benford and Joe Marino with a good idea on what really happened that was wrong with carbon-14. That's a picture of Sue Benford and Joe Marino. So the, here's what they theorized. What had happened in 1988 is the uh, Italian scientist in Turin took over control of the shroud and ignored the international community. They ignored the American team, they ignored the Germans, they ignored everybody. And in secret, they took a sample. The, the committee had said, take six little samples. The people in Turin overruled that and took one sample. Not only did they just take one sample, but they took the sample up in the corner, right where Margaret de Charnay...
Xenia? That was actually taken, and you can see the original linen on the bottom, and I drew the artificial white line, and the cotton patch above, and you can see that the, the cloth looks a little different on the top. It's not as white. The little tufts are not as strong. On the close-up, the original linen on the left looks way more vibrant. There's many more uh, white, uh, vibrant structures with little tiny uh, canals. And on the right side, those white structures look all beat up with wide canals. So that you can easily tell the difference between linen and cotton. So the, so the sample then was a mixture of cotton and linen. So to this day, they have really never done a carbon-14 dating of the real shroud. So this is who proved it, Ray Rogers, the lead chemist from uh, Los Alamos Laboratories. He did a study with three other people between 2001 and 2005, and he showed the linen mixed with the cotton under the microscope. He showed how they use sticky tape to, to take one fiber and stick it to the next. He showed that the coloring was all over the cotton to make it look yellow. He showed how they were end to end. A cotton fiber was stuck to a linen fiber. There it is again. And also the breakdown of where all the samples went. Excuse this is the me. interesting part. If you look at the A2 at the bottom, that's the second sample to Arizona carbon-14, and far on the right is A1, that's Arizona. Um, Dr. Phillips, Dr. Yes, Phillips? can you hear me? Yeah, can we stop? Somebody's talking in the background. Can you tell them to stop talking, please? Because it's okay. bothering us. I'll stop. Can, can you tell them? Can you or tell they them because they're going to hear me? Or they can mute their phone if they want to... Uh, uh, Continue talking. Yeah, because so somebody's talking on the background and everybody can hear what they're talking and they okay. can hear you. Tell her to switch to her phone or cover up the microphone on her computer. Yes, please. Hello, ladies. Whoever's talking in the background? Yeah, somebody's talking in the background. Okay, go, go ahead now, doctor. Is that okay? Yes, please. Okay. All right. So uh, this is the uh, sample that was taken, and I, I have it into different pieces. And at the bottom, you can see the far left was one of the Arizona samples, and the far right was another Arizona sample. So they represent a difference in how much of the sample is cotton, which is above the white line, and how much of the sample is linen. So as you go from left to right, the amount of cotton that comes from the year 1500 goes way up and the amount of linen goes way down. So Arizona disagreed with itself. They said it's 1238 and they also said it's 1430. So that just shows you more evidence that a patch job, a medieval reweaving took place. So this is how they did it. You can see the two cloths in this depiction being we uh, weaved together the linen and the cotton put up, and then you can see how the cotton is interspersed and slowly weaves into the, the aged linen. It goes deep into the linen. So what happened then in 2005, this was published in all kind of high-level chemistry journals, and it was accepted by the scientists of the world, and from 2005 to 2015, all those scientists in the Shroud Science Group are back working on it. They're all enthusiastic again. And I'm just their reporter. I don't, I don't do the scientific experiments. But the new theories on how the image was formed, I'm going to show you because it's really interesting. So here we go. So the characteristics of the image, we know. We know all the characteristics of the image. But we have to put together a theory on how they got on the cloth. So we're dealing with a problem. The man has no ears and no cheeks. The hair is floating into space. The hair looks like it's been hit by a hair dryer. There's blood in the hair rather than being on the cheek. You can see his teeth. You also can, uh, well, you don't, I haven't told you this, but under the blood, there is no image. So whatever the energy was that came out of the body, it was so weak and so controlled that it wasn't strong enough to pass through blood. It only hit the linen where there was no blood. So it changed the color. It broke the carbohydrate molecule, the carbon-carbon bonds, and it aged the two tight fibrils of a 200 fibril fiber. Okay? So it's very, very controlled. 
Now we're going to tell you how the 3D happened. So there's the body of the man of the shroud, and there's the blue shroud. And you can see where the shroud is touching his toe, his knee, his hand, his chest, his chin, his nose, and his forehead. So those are actual contact points. And in those points, the darkest image is there. The strongest amount of energy <coughs> hit it. The rest of the energy had to jump through space. It had to jump three or four inches to put an image of his thigh and his chest and his neck and his legs. But as you get past three or four inches away, as the shroud gets further away from the body, there is no image. So as you can see here, the arms are crossed. You can see the hands. And there's kind of almost a circle of darkness around his hands because his hands are lifting up the shroud away from the rest of the body at least four or five inches. So that as you get far, far away, the body's energy giving off wasn't able to go four to five inches. So here's what the image has now as of 2015. This is what all the shroud scientists say. There's no image under the blood weak energy. The energy had to come perpendicular because it has no sides. It's very superficial, only two little fibers. The closer you are to it, the darker the image, therefore it's 3D. The carbon, uh, the chemistry of the image is that the carbon-carbon bonds are broken, given it an artificial age. And I didn't tell you about this, but when you have a photograph of a person, you always know where the light is in the room. But this light comes out of all the body. It doesn't bounce off the body. It comes off every square inch of the body the same amount of light. Therefore, there are no shadows on this at all. There's no edges because of the difference in distances on each edge. And as I said, the power fades out after three or four inches. It's also a very detailed picture. The pixels in it to make that body front and back would total 5.6 gigs of data. So there we are. Now, how did the image happen? These are all the facts. What can we say to tell, to tell us what happened at the moment of resurrection? Here we go. You have a problem. You've got to have a two-position event. The first is the pre-image when the cloth was sticking to the body with all the blood and, and clots. So you have uh, the, uh, the cloth and, and the body and the and the blood are all one. They're all stuck together, just like you've had blood stick to your clothes. Problem is you've got to get that body out of that cloth without disturbing the clots because the clots are pristine clots. They have not been moved. They're, the riblets of blood are not broken. They're perfect. So you have to have position one, and then you've got to get into position two because you have to have a flat shroud or you don't have a photograph. So if you don't have a flat shroud, you've got cylindrical distortion. That's the top left, this crazy fat hair and crazy fat face. So the shroud has to be like the bottom right. It's a flat shroud that has no cylindrical distortion. So you've got to get from position one to position two without having the man of the shroud stand up and take the shroud off. So the reason this happens, this is the number one theory, Dr. John Jackson's fall-through hypothesis is that the body began to dematerialize. And at one point, it was mechanically, meaning it had no power to hold something up against gravity, it was mechanically transparent. So the shroud starts falling through the body. And here's what he said in October 2014. This is looking down at the top of the head of the man of the shroud, and going around his nose is the shroud, touching his cheek, the blood is coming off his cheek, touching the shroud, and you can see way down in the middle of his head are those little ears sticking out. Now here's what happens. The body starts becoming mechanically transparent, and gravity is going to pull the shroud to a flat position. The shroud starts falling through the body. The energy is radiating out of the body as the matter turns into energy, making that image. It hasn't quite fallen to the ear level. And then finally the shroud falls past the ears. So by the time the shroud got to the ears, there was no more energy left to make any effect on the shroud. So therefore the shroud has no sides and no ears because of the fall through effect. And then finally the body's totally gone, totally disappeared. So what happens then? There was a dematerialization according to the science of 2015. Every atom turned into energy and gave a a laser-like pixelated burst 
aiming at the shroud, clear enough to make a photograph. Matter turned into energy. And where do we see that? We see it in Star Trek. <laughs> Beam me up, Scotty. This is exactly <laughs> what happened. Uh -huh. Matter and the, and the body of the man in the shroud turned into energy and went somewhere. Now, of course, we're not smart enough to know what exactly the energy did and what exactly the matter did. We just know what the shroud shows us. So I am through with my talk, and I will open the, uh, the, uh, the routine here to whatever questions you have. I'm not in a hurry. Hit me with some questions. You okay? Everybody there? So the shroud, uh, the shroud is authentic then? The shroud is authentic. Now, I didn't tell you the one test that we can't do to make it 100% authentic. You want to know that or you want to just guess? You want to know. <laughs> okay, I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, so the one scientific test that's missing that we will never have, so we're never going to be able to prove the shroud 100% authentic because we will never get DNA comparison. You have to have a DNA match to prove that the same blood is Jesus Christ. So we have blood on the shroud. We can get a DNA sample, but we got to compare that to a fresh sample. So until Jesus decides to show up in a lab, stick his arm out and give us some blood, we are not going to be able to make a DNA match. So that's never going to happen, right? Yep. 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 That's okay. <laughs> so we're 99.9% .9 sure you're looking at the burial cloth of, of Jesus at the moment of the resurrection. So in this terrible, secular, crazy world, only now, since 2005, can scientists say this thing is real. So you got to get the message out to the world because it was done for a reason and it's done to bring in the doubting Thomases of the scientific world that say, you got to show me I don't believe anything. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're going to have fun seeing this route. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Dr. Phillips. Thank you. You're very welcome. You. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Have a safe trip. And no thank more you. questions from anybody? I have, a uh, sure. I have one question. Sure. Okay. Why does he look so old in the picture? In the yeah, that's a, that's a false uh, mental uh, way everybody thinks because of the white hair and he's so beat up and it's long and scraggly. But uh, according to um, pathologists, he is about 34 years old. He's 5 foot 11. He weighs about 175 pounds and he's very muscular. Huh. That's the white beard, the, the, the way it, you see as a photographing negative, but you see a black and white. You don't see a color picture. Oh, oh, That's why he looks old. He's not old. All right. I know he wasn't supposed to. Everybody look. says that. It's really funny. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. So we're actually going to see, uh, please give us an idea of how Jesus looks like when we get there. Absolutely. Now remember, it's a, it's a cloth falling through a body, so it's not a 100% photograph, but it's, it's probably about 95% right. But you're going to see, remember what I said, you're going to see the, uh, the photographic negative that is the light picture of the shroud. So you're not going to see the one that I've been showing you. I've been showing you the, the black and white reverse. It has much more detail. You're going to see that first shroud. Remember? Here, let me show you the, the one you're going to see. Some nice hmm. It's odd it won't come up. Well, I'm trying to show it to you. My computer seems to have frozen. It's frozen? Yeah, it won't do anything. At least he's got frozen in the end. 
So anyway, it's a very, it, the first picture I ever showed you was the one where the image is very faint and very subtle. So don't be disappointed because since it's real, it's subtle. It doesn't look like a painting. Mm. I can't get my computer to, I'm going to have to make it, uh, so I have to shut it down by force. It's totally frozen for some reason. Okay, so uh, go to shroud.com if you got you time so and read, read some more. You're very welcome. Have a great trip. Are there any souvenirs we can buy there? Like, um, when we get yeah, there, like, tons of them, tons of them. They're very inexpensive. You can buy little cards. You can buy little frames that are two inches by three inches of just the head or the whole body, five by seven. They're all over the place. You're going to go crazy. It's all inexpensive. Okay. And do they have books? Yeah, well, no. The books are all Italian. To get books from the Shroud, you go to Amazon.com and you type Shroud, and you'll have a choice of about 30. Oh, okay. Thank you. Which one would you recommend wow. the best? <laughs> the, the newest one I like is by Klotz, K-L-O-T-Z. He's written one pretty recent uh, that I think is really is a good, good summary of it. So he's the most recent one. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a, a little heavy on the science, but... You guys, uh, I think you can handle it. Oh, okay. You could, it's not super science. It's just, uh, you, you're all college graduates, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so you'll be able to handle it. I mean, if you, were, if you only went through grammar school, you might not be able to pick it up. But college graduates, Klotz is a good one. You'll be able to get the whole thing. Great history, too. So, question. By, yeah. the, end of this, by the end of your research study, the 138 people became... Catholic? <laughs> um, let me see. That takes a guess. Let me see. I think that all the agnostics are now Catholic. Wow. Um, Praise the Lord. Yep. Praise God. But he, here's the biggest joke of all. The guy that took all the photographs, name is Barry Schwartz. He's a Jew. Mm-hmm. And um, he 100% believes the shroud is real. Mm-hmm. But he won't say he's becoming a Christian. He just won't do it. Now, I used, oh. to blame, I used to blame the fact that his mother was still alive, and he would, his mother would have a heart attack if he changed from Jewish to Christian. So I used to give him an excuse that he wouldn't do it till his mother died. But his mother did die about three months ago, and he's still, uh, still hemming and hawing. I, I don't know what he's doing. I guess he thinks he's more believable if he's a Jew talking about Jesus. <laughs> but that's pretty funny he's the one that invented and runs the biggest website in the world called shroud.com it's got everything oh, really? ever done on it yeah you go to shroud.com you can read everything for years oh, okay. Dr. Phillips yes Dr. Phillips are you talking yes. about the book entitled The Coming of the Quantum Christ by yes Jesus? that's it okay. yes The Quantum Christ is the newest little book that has a lot of good stuff in it. Okay, well, have a good time. Send me any emails. If if y'all got questions, just email me at Wayne Shroud, okay? All right. Wayne Shroud, Yahoo.com. I'll answer your questions. Thank you so much. Okay, you're very welcome. Have a wonderful trip. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, doctor. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. Okay. Everybody, Bye. thank you for attending. Thank you, guys. Thank see you in the you, see you in two weeks. See you in on the pilgrimage. Yeah, thank see you on the twenty-first in Milan. All right. Okay. Bye. bye. Thank you, guys.